So just so that we're clear on what we are trying to accomplish in this particular video, these are your learning objectives for the video. Uh, okay, and so the first one is that you're going to define important terms for traceability and the uncertainty of measurement. You'll calculate the uncertainty of measurement, which is what you're working on right now in lab. Uh, and then also, you'll explain the parts of an uncertainty budget. Okay, and so the first thing to talk about then is traceability. What is traceability? Well, the property of a, the result of a measurement or the value of a standard whereby it can be related to stated references, right? Usually a national or international standards through an unbroken chain of comparisons, all having state uncertainties. And so when you look at a measuring device and it says on it that it's been traceable, right? Either traceable to NIST, which is the National Institute of Science and Technology, or traceable to one of the international standards references, uh, like the one that's in France, right? Uh, what that means is that the measuring device that you're using, say it was uh, not a measuring device, but say it was a standard weight, for example, like a one kilogram weight, uh, if it was if it's stated that it's traceable to NIST standards, um, then what that means is that that one kilogram weight was compared to another kilogram weight, that was compared to another kilogram weight, that was compared to another kilogram weight. Why? Right? They all have their stated uncertainties, and they were traced with each other all the way back to the one that is the national standard or reference in at the National uh, Institute of uh, science and technology because they have a kilogram uh, reference standard there, right? And so that's what traceability means. And it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to always be about weights. It can be about anything. So, for example, in the lab, uh, in the lab you used a uh, in the lab you used a thermometer, right, to uh, check the temperature of water. That thermometer was actually labeled as being NIST traceable. So what that means is that it was calibrated using materials, reference materials that were linked to other reference materials that can be linked all the way back to the uh, uncertainty of, uh, not the uncertainty, sorry, the reference standard that was back at NIST, the National Standards of Institute in Technology. And what that means is that they're reliable readings, right? They're reliable measurements. And the reason why they are reliable is because each time the different standard, right, was, uh, was linked or traced from standard to standard, the uncertainty for each of those standards was documented. And so when you look at the traceability or you look at an instrument that's been, been rated as been traceable uh, to NIST, you know that when they calibrated the instrument, uh, there's a chain of standards that they used, right, that go all the way back to NIST and all the uncertainties are, have been stated there. And so the uncertainty that you can see or read in the calibration records of that particular standard that you're using at your lab uh, will include the uncertainties of all the other standards that link all the way back to NIST, which means that, again, it makes it a very reliable, uh, a very reliable uh, measurement, okay? So that's what traceability means. Why do we use some traceability, like I said before? Uh, it supports validity and accuracy in calibration and test measurements, right? Uh, if we didn't have that, again, we would not even know what we're measuring were actually <laughs> the true measurements or close, even close to true measurements, right? And so when you're in, the, in any kind of analytical chemistry lab, uh, whether it be a forensic chemistry lab or a, uh, or a uh, uh, body fluids testing lab like uh, urine testing, blood testing, or anything like that, like LabCorp or Quest, they all use analytical instrumentation to do those tests and measuring instruments to do those tests. And all those things have to be traceable back to NIST, right? For them to be uh, using, uh, for them to be able to be reporting their data and reporting their results under the accreditation that we spoke of uh, in the previous video, the ANAB <laughs> accreditation, okay? So that's what traceability means. So what is then the difference between a test and a measurement? Well, to be clear, right, a test is a determination of one or more characteristics, right? Whereas a measurement is actually an experimental, uh, an experiment that can be used to obtain a quantity of something, right? Uh, and so, and in other words, a test is something very qualitative where, you know, you can say, hey, uh, do I have or do I not have something in this sample? A qualitative test, right? Uh, 
uh, you're not necessarily measuring how much there is in that sample. Whereas measurement means that you are actually measuring the quantity of something in that sample. So this is also synonymous, well, not synonymous, but um, analogous. No, that's not the right word either. It's kind of like uh, being the difference between being qualitative and quantitative, right? A qualitative test says what is what is there, whereas a quantitative test says how much of it is there, right? So in chemistry, especially analytical chemistry, both of those kinds of uh, of those both of those kinds of results can occur. You can have a qualitative result or you can have a quantitative result, but the vast majority of the uh, the vast majority of the uh, results that we get in analytical chemistry are going to be quantitative results. Um, so the question at the bottom says, Does uncer is uncertainty associated with a test or a measurement or both? Really, uncertainty is associated with just measurements. Because if you remember back when I, back in the previous video, when I was talking about the ANAV accreditation, the ANAV accreditation says specifically that all measurements, right, have to have uncertainty applied to them, right? So anything that's quantitative needs to have uh, uh, an uncertainty applied to it. And so if it's just a qualitative test, like what is there, what is not there, then it doesn't really have an, uh, an uncertainty. It's only measurements. So that's the difference between a test and a measurement. So let's, say, let's ask the question, what exactly is a measurement? Well, a measurement is, <clears throat> excuse me, a measurement is an objective Sorry, let me rephrase that. <laughs> What's measurement? A measurement is uh, is this. Objective of the of a measurement is to determine the value of a measurand, right? And so a lot of people will confuse the word measurement and not really know what it means. Well, the measurement is the act of measuring something, right? Whereas the measurand is the actual quantity of what you're measuring, okay? Excuse me. And so uh, the measurand is actually what you're doing when you're saying, hey, this thing has, you know, 11 inches or something like that, or this thing has 56 mils, right? That's called the measurand. That's the quantity of the thing that's intended to be measured. The result of the measurement, <coughs> excuse me, the result of the measurement is determined to be based on the series of observations obtained under readable, repeatable conditions. So here you can see the phrase repeatable conditions. Why do you think then we are asking you, or I am asking you, or telling you to do in your uncertainty budget lab, uh, sorry, uncertainty of measurement lab uh, to you know take repeated measurements of the same thing over and over again. Well, because to obtain a uh, a reliable result, uh, you have to have repeatable conditions, right? And so you have to take measurements over and over and over again. The result of the measurement is only an estimate, which I've made this clear multiple times in class, right? When you are measuring something, it's only an estimate. You have the true value, but when you measure something you're only estimating what it is, right? You don't know what the actual true value is. Uh, and so that's why we have to apply uncertainty uh, to all the measurements that we take, right? That's why we have to apply uncertainty to all the measurements we take. And so that's why you're doing the lab that you're working on right now because, you know, you're pipetting out, say, 500 micro microliters, but it's not actually 500 microliters, is it? It's actually an estimation of 500 microliters. Or you're weighing something that's 50 milligrams, but really it's not actually 50 milligrams, it's, a, it's an estimation, right? You're pretty close to 50 milligrams, but we're not exactly sure what the, how close you are to the true value, right, of what it is, okay? So, that takes us then talk, to talking about the difference between uncertainty, uncertainty and error, right? Uncertainty is what we're working on in lab right now. Error is a component of that. Right, so the difference between the measured value and the true value is the thing that uh, is what we call error, right? Uh, and so, what is the uncertainty of measurement? And that's the quantification of the doubt about the measurement result, right? And so, error is usually just a single number, whereas or a value, right? How far you are away from the true value, whereas uncertainty of measurement is uh, a range, plus or minus something, right? Plus or minus. Uh, 0 0.05 mils, for example, right? Uh, you could be plus 0 0.5 mils or a minus 0 0.05 mils, right? From your actual uh, measured value. And that's what an uncertainty is, right? So the error is the actual number or value that you are away from the true value. 
your measurement is from the true value. Whereas uncertainty of measurement is uh, a quantification or a range, right, uh, of doubt that's in the measurement itself, right? So it's a plus or minus uh, type of thing. That's how you tell the difference real quickly, right? Error is a single di single value, whereas uh, uncertainty of measurement will always be uncertainty of measurement will always be a plus or minus uh, type of term. Okay, so taking this even further, right? When a measurement is made, it is only an estimate, like we said that already before, right? So this is often repeated as a, uh, so the uncertainty is often uh, reported as a standard deviation, right? So you, you should, we should already know what a standard deviation is. I, I talked about it at nauseum in the previous video, uh, but we can use the standard deviation as a, a measure of the uncertainty. Uh, and so this is also known as what we call the standard uncertainty. And you'll see how that fits into a, uh, into a, uh, uh, uncertainty budget in, in a couple of slides, okay? What does it say at the bottom here? It says, knowledge of uncertainty implies increased confidence in the validity of measurement and result. And what that means is the fact that if you know what your uncertainty is, then you can confidently say that your measurement is within uh, uh, a, an acceptable range to the true value, right? So it gives you confidence in your, in your, in your measurements. If you didn't have an uncertainty uh, apply, uh, applied to your measurement, then you'd have no idea whether or not your measured value was close to the true value, right? And that's very important in many situations, especially in court, when they're trying to figure out exactly how many grams of marijuana you have, and if you have enough for possession, or you have enough for trafficking, and it's a big deal, right? Having the exact values, or having as close as possible to the exact values is very important, right? So, <laughs> I think that every science student, right, a science major has seen a, a PowerPoint slide that looks like this where it describes the difference between accuracy and precision. Uh, accuracy is the degree of closeness of measurements to the actual value or the true value, whereas precision is the degree at which repeated measurements under unchanged conditions show the same results, right? And so when we look at something like this, what we really want is a combination of both right where we have both high accuracy and high precision right both this is where we want to be in our measurements <laughs> we don't want to be all over the place with low precision and we don't want to be low accuracy super far away from our our uh, our our, uh, our uh, true value right so we don't want that definitely want that and that's the worst case scenario down there where it's low accuracy and low precision. You definitely want to be in this area here where you have high accuracy, meaning very close to the true value, and then high precision, where you, if you take the measurement multiple times, it's going to be very close to each other, right? And again, just to be clear, that's the reason why in the lab that you're working on right now for uncertainty of measurement, you're taking multiple data points of the same thing over and over and over again to see your precision, right? To see your precision. Um, so this is just a, another representation of accuracy versus precision. And you can see as you move to the right on the x-axis, precision increases. As you move up on the y-axis, uh, trueness or accuracy increases, right? And we want to be up here in this upper right-hand corner where our precision and our accuracy or trueness are super high, right? And so over here, we can see what looks like a bell curve, right? So this is also known as a normal distribution. This is also known as a normal distribution. Uh, and on a normal distribution, right, we know that the mean is always the center of bell, the bell curve, right? Okay. But the question that we don't know is how close the mean is to the actual true value. Okay. So there are a couple different, uh, there are a couple different types of error that are involved here. There's system error, right, which is also known as bias, right? But then there's also random error, right? And random error is actually the, the thing that's associated with the measurements themselves, right? Being, uh, being random and having forming this bell curve that we have right here that, that's this wide, right? Over and over. So another way of calling this random error is also known as precision. Precision is another, another name for that random error. So let's take a closer look at this, right? Let's take a closer look at what the difference is then between the two different types of error. So again, the two different types of error are random and systematic, right? And random error is where you have repeating measurements, right? 
gives randomly different results, right? So it kind of makes sense because it's not systematic, it's random, right? And the thing about it is that it cannot be quantified, right? But usually the way you fix this kind of problem where you have all this random error is just to take extra measurements, okay? So the moral of that story is that the more measurements you take, the better your, the better your error is, right? Or the smaller your error is which is the reason why you're taking 25 data points, right, for each type of weight that you're doing an uncertainty, uh, of, uh, uncertainty of measurement budget for, uh, for each balance, right? And that's the reason why you're taking 25 uh, 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 data points for each uh, volume of each liquid handling device that you're gonna be creating a uncertainty of measurement budget for, right? Because the more, data points you have, the more likely it is that you can minimize your random error, okay? Uh, so in all, all in all, you're gonna have more than a thousand data points and that's gonna help a lot with your random error. And remember, remember this, right? When you're creating your uncertainty budgets, you want your uncertainty budgets to show uncertainties that are as small as possible. Because remember that your grade is dependent on the fact that you have uh, a, 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 an answer, right? A result that's close to the true value. And so, uh, and remember to get an A, you have to have a, true, uh, a result that is within 5% of the true value. And if you don't have uh, an uncertainty that's small after doing the uncertainty budget, that's small enough, right? Your true value, I mean, sorry, your measured value or your result could be plus or minus whatever that uncertainty is that's really big because you didn't take a lot of measurements. And if it's a really big uncertainty, then you might exceed right? That 5% that I've set as a limit for you to get an A with your results, okay? And if it exceeds that, you're not going to get an A, right? So that's another reason why it's important to have more data points. <laughs> I guess getting a good grade is, is secondary to the fact that, that, that the more data points you have, the, 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 minimize, the more you minimize the potential for, for random error, okay? We also then have systematic error, right? Systematic area, area, <laughs> systematic error is where the same influence that affects the result for each repeated, the same influence affects the result for each of the repeated measurements, okay? So this is kind of a predictable thing, okay? So say there was some kind of uh, defect in the uh, thermometer you're using and it was always gonna be off by one degree, right? So that's a systematic error because every time you measured, the uh, every time you measured the uh, temperature of something, it was off by one degree, and so the, the the interesting thing about that is system error is actually very easy to correct, and the way you correct it is by uh, uh, correcting that particular error, right, or that the that influence that's causing the systematic error. And so in this case, it was a thermometer that had a defect in which it gave every temperature reading an extra one degree, right. And so if you were to replace that thermometer with another thermometer of the exact same model, which didn't have that defect, and then, you, then you would have eliminated the system error, right? And then things are back to normal again, right? And this is actually very true of, uh, of, uh, of thermometers because I don't know if you remember, but during the height of the pandemic, people were measuring their temperature using these infrared thermometers that they used to shoot at your head, right? But the problem with that is that your head, your forehead, right? It uses infrared to detect the temperature, is actually, which is actually quite accurate. And it's not actually the problem with the thermometer. The problem is that your skin is not super consistent when it comes to temperature, right? Say you're slightly hot that day and you're sweating. Well, if you sweat, your skin is gonna be on average one to two degrees more cool than normal, right? And so say normal, normal temperature is what? Uh, normal uh, body temperature is 98.6 degrees, right? But if the temperature you take, right? using that infrared thermometer says that it's, you know, 98.6, but you're actually one to two degrees cooler than you're actually, or sorry, you're actually one to two degrees hotter than in fact, at the max, you're actually at a hundred degrees, which is a fever, right? So that's, that's a, that, that, that's a very common thing that happens when people use infrared thermometers, because when you sweat, it actually cools down your skin by one to two degrees. And so infrared thermometers that take temperature on your forehead, uh, forehead is not quite as accurate as say for example a rectal thermometer right where <laughs> sweat isn't an issue okay so once you correct a systematic error the effect then is now zero right the effect of the systematic error is now zero 
uh, which is good. That's what you want, right? You want the you want to minimize the uh, uh, you want to minimize the systematic error as much as possible. Uh, and so you can remove it by, for example, changing out the, the thermometer. In this case, if you're doing COVID tests or something like that, or just checking people for fevers, uh, switch from a, 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 a infrared thermometer to a rectal thermometer, and you'll uh, remove that systematic error, right? And everything comes to zero. So what does that look like graphically, graphically then, right? What does that look like graphically then? Well, here we have our, our uh, normal distribution again, right? And here's our mean right there. And so our true value is all over here, right? And so the distance there, or the value, between the mean and the true value, right, uh, is known as the systematic error, right? And so that's some number, right? There's a distance there, that's some number, okay? But if we were able to remove the systematic error by, for example, getting rid of an infrared thermometer and using a rectal thermometer instead, we can actually correct it. That's been corrected, right? And so when we correct it, then the mean becomes much closer to the true value. And you get very close to uh, having a mean that is consistent with the true value. And that's what happens in systematic error, right? You correct the systematic error and the mean will move over, right? The mean of all the readings, all the observations will move over to be closer to the true value. But that's incumbent on the fact that you identify what the systematic error is, right? And so, for example, again, in that thermometer example, you identify the fact that skin has uh, inconsistent temperatures because of sweat, right? And so you... You use a thermometer that doesn't have to use skin. It can use a rectal thermometer, right? And then so you've corrected that error and now the mean of all your data points is much closer to the true value. Contrast this with random error, right? Where you have 10 measurements and your bell curve, your distribution is quite wide, right? Quite wide. Your mean is still in the middle, like normal, right? But there's a huge distance here between here and here of where all your measurements can lay when it's only 10 measurements. Let's say you move up to 50 measurements. Notice that this distance now is much shorter, right? The mean's still the same, much shorter, right? At 50 measurements. Going up to all the way up to 100 measurements, right? Now, this distance here, this width here of the bell curve is much, much more narrow. And so you get most of your, uh, your readings, right? Uh, your, your measurements will be much closer to the mean, right? Whereas if you only took measure, 10 measurements, you're all the way out here on the fringes here, not even that close to your mean. So the more, um, so to correct random error, then the more, the, what you have to do then is to take more measurements, right? And the more measurements, the merrier, right? So what are the types of sources, right, for uncertainty, right? Well, there's a couple of different types of sources for uncertainty. There's a type A method, or type, sorry, a type A source, and there's a type B source, okay? So a type A source is a method of uncertainty that, uh, that, that involves some kind of statistical analysis. And what that means is, for example, it involves some kind of standard deviation. Well, what that means then is that it involves de collecting data, right? And when you're collecting data, a person is involved, right? Only a person can collect data. And so when you have to do that kind of, 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 of uh, if you have to, when you have to evaluate that kind of source of uncertainty, that's a type A source of uncertainty that involves some kind of human interaction, right? Some sort of operator that has to collect the data. And type A, uh, type A errors or type A sources of uncertainty will always have a Gaussian shape or normal distribution, right? Which is the one that we were just talking about here. This kind of normal distribution or Gaussian distribution or bell curve distribution, okay? And so uh, the normal or Gaussian shape distribution. Okay, uh, and so the example it gives you here is the multiple certified weight measurements, which is what you're actually doing in lab now, right? You and your lab partner are actually using certified weights, and you are measuring the weights of the certified. You're measuring the masses of the certified weights on the balances that you are uh, creating the uncertainty of budget, uh, uncertainty of measurement budget for, right? Uh, and so. Since you and your lab partner are doing this action, <laughs> that's a type A source of uncertainty and it has a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution, which we'll talk about what that means later in the, uh, in the uh, construction of the uncertainty budget itself. The second type of uncertainty source is called a type B, and type B sources uh, are sources that come from something other than 
a, a, a statistical analysis of, of measurements, right? And so the, the easiest way to explain this is that they are the sources of uncertainty that come from the manufacturer themselves, right? So the manufacturer will, uh, will or, or even calibration certificates will indicate on their calibration certificates or even in the instruction manuals, uh, readability of certain uh, uh, instruments. So readability means how many decimal points you can see or even tolerances, right? And all of those would be the would be type B sources, things that don't really involve human uh, measuring or human interaction with the instrument itself. So again, the example that we have here is the readability of the balance. Two of you, uh, two groups in the lab uh, while doing this had had three place balances, which are the precision balances, right? So your readability was like 0 0.001, right? Which is three balance, three three places, right? While two other groups in the lab well, used analytical balances that have four place four places, right? So its readability would be 0 0.0001. Did I count that right? 0 .0, 0 0 0001. Yes, four places, right? And so the readability of a balance would be a type B type of uncertainty. And if you have a type B type of uncertainty, you actually have a random or rectangular distribution. Okay. And these types of distributions have direct impact on your uncertainty budget because they will indicate a different divisor in the, uh, uh, in the uncertainty budget. And we'll get to that in a second. Okay. So let's take a closer look at a normal distribution, also known as a Gaussian curve and also known as a bell curve, right? And so when you look at a normal distribution, and remember the normal distribution uh, is uh, also indicative of a type A source of uncertainty, right? It involves measuring things, right? It involves some kind of statistical analysis on, on values that have been measured, right? The data points that were measured from some kind of measuring device. And so for a normal distribution, what, me, what that means is that the values that were measured, right, or the measure rands, are more likely to be near the mean than they are to be away from the mean, far away from the mean, which you can see here from this curve, right, because when you're all the way out here at this tail or this tail of the curve, right, you're really far away from the mean. So that, that would be an indication that maybe that you have like an outlier or something like that. Because the vast majority of the uh, measurements that you take, those measure rands, will be very close to the mean. And that's why the area under uh, where the, the area close under the curve near where the mean is is so wide and so big. And that's because the vast majority of the, number, the, uh, the measure rands will be close to the mean, right? And if you recall from the, the previous video, we were talking about uh, the two-tailed t-test, right? Or the two-tailed test. Uh, we always use the two-tail test because uh, we don't know whether or not your measured value here will be some value minus or some value plus from the mean, right? And the two tails actually refer to these two tails of the Gaussian distribution right here, right? So whenever you're looking at the statistical tables and it asks you, right, which, or you're, it gives you options on which, which tail to use, one tail or two tail, you're going to be using the two-tail test because we're basing all of our measurements uh, and our statistics on a normal distribution, right? And so that's what it means to have a normal distribution. The fact that measurements should be very close to the mean, right? And very unlikely will, be the, will, will they be far away from the mean. And that's why the shape of a normal distribution is the way it is because you'll have very few numbers that are that far from the mean. Contrast this with then a rectangular distribution right, where there is no difference in the size of the peak, right, excuse me, the peak across the A minus or the A plus, right, over here, the, the, uh, the, the A plus, as you approach A plus or A minus, right, the line starts to get infinitesimally smaller and smaller and smaller, right, asymptotically closer to the axis right, where the likelihood of getting a measurement out that far is super low. But compare that then to a rectangular distribution, right, where it's the same distance, right, from here to here, no matter where you are on the, uh, in the, uh, in the, uh, the curve, or lack thereof, of a curve, right?
And so rectangular distributions are also known as type B sources of uncertainty, right? And it kind of makes sense though that these are are rectangular distributions type B because type B on sources of uncertainty come from the manufacturer, right? They don't involve any kind of human measuring. Well, the calibration, I guess, in the process of the quality control before they send the instrument to you for you to use. But the, the, you get the value from a calibration certificate, right? Or you get the value from the instrument, the uh, the instrument's uh, instruction manual, right? You yourself, the operator, did not have to go through and do any kind of, of, of measuring to get that number. And so since these numbers are provided to you by the instrument manufacturer, right, they are rectangular distribution. And so, again, just to be clear, when you have a rectangular distribution or a type B uncertainty, the distribution of the values, it's it has an equal likelihood of falling anywhere in that range, right, of A minus to A plus, right, with the mean being in the middle, right? But there is, you know, with the mean being in the middle, unlike with the distribution of... Uh, a normal distribution where your values will be closer to the mean than further away from the mean, right? And again, the the implications are this, right? Type A distributions, right, or type A sources that have normal distributions will have a different divisor in the uh, uh, in the uh, uh, uncertainty budget than uh, B type B sources will, okay? Because their their distributions are different, right? They're they're uh, uh, one is a rectangular distribution for the type B, and one is the uh, uh, and one is the Gaussian distribution or normal distribution for the type A, and we'll talk about what those divisors are later, uh, and what they mean later when we actually build our uncertainty budget. Okay, and so what is what are the steps then of creating an uncertainty budget? Right. Well, first thing you got to specify the measure and, and so <laughs> right now in lab you are specifying the measure and. That measure and is the uh, the weight or the mass of a standard weight, right? So the measure and the measure and here would be like the one gram weight, or the 0.1 gram weight, or the 0.01 gram weight, right? And then when you get to the pipetters and the serological pipettes, there will be the different volumes that you're using, right? So you you specify the measure and, right? Then you identify the uh, and characterize the uncertainty sources. That's a type A or type B sources, right? You quantify the uncertainty components. You convert the components into standard deviations, which will actually all be three, all those three steps that we just said are gonna be one big step that we do in the uncertainty budget calculation. After that, we will calculate the combined standard uncertainty. And after that, we'll calculate the expanded uncertainty. Uh, and then we'll report the uncertainty, right? And so again, like I said before, the first, after we do the specific, after we specify the measure and, uh, we will characterize, identify and characterize the uncertainty sources and then do the quantity, quantifying these uncertainty components and then converting those components to standard deviations. All that stuff happens in, in, in the one step. But, <laughs> I say one step, but you're working on it right now, right? So the part that you're working on in the lab right now uh, is, uh, uh, is quantifying the uncertainty components. That's what you're doing right now, right? Uh, while by going through and measuring all those different standard weights over and over and over again and then after that measuring all the different volumes from the different liquid handling devices over and over and over again that's that's you quantifying the, uh, the uncertainty components right and then after you quantify those uncertainty components we can go through and do standard deviations on all those data sets right and so uh, in the in the the whole scheme of creating an uncertainty budget this is where you are right now because you're still in the middle of measuring uh, the uh, the balance uncertainty, right? Most of you should already be at this point. I think all of you are actually at this point measuring the the salt uh, in the uh, uh, on the balances, right? So the measurement assurance, uh, which is a source of uncertainty, by the way. So anyway, let's go ahead and talk about this first this this big thing right here, which is these three steps right here that are that that are actually done all together. Okay, so. First step, character, identify and characterize the uncertainty sources, right? You have to identify all the possible sources of uncertainty in a comprehensive list. That's the uncertainty budget, right, uh, that I keep on talking about. You're going to categorize them as either type A or type B, right? And then you can use something like a fishbone diagram to help you organize uh, any other uncertainties and anything related uh, based on their relatedness, right? 
you will have to make a fishbone diagram for your report. And so let me give you an example of some fishbone diagrams here, right? So in the upper left-hand corner right here, right, we have a very simple fishbone diagram for just doing a simple dilution, which is the M1 V1 equals M2 V2, right? You've done that calculation multiple times in GenCam Lab, haven't you? Yes, you have, right? The only difference here is that they're, instead of using M1 V1, sorry, instead of using M1 and M2, they're using C1 and C2. And the reason for that is because M stands for molarity, right? And we use that in chemistry the most. But there are other units of concentration, like PPM, milligrams per mil, which you should have seen the milligrams per mil in the previous video when we did the propagation of uncertainty uh, uh, example, right? And so you can see here then that uh, in the process of doing a dilution of standardly, standardly, <laughs> of commercially available standard cocaine, we have to dilute that to a working concentration, okay? And so the, 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 the goal is always this line, right, the backbone of the fish right here, the goal that you're trying to get to, right? And so that goal right there, C2, right, is the diluted cocaine standard, right? Well, what are all the steps you have to go through? And what's all the equipment you have to go through? And what's all the uncertainty you have to go through to get to that endpoint, right? Well, the first thing you have to have is uh, the commercially available standard, right? Either a powder or a solution. In this case, it probably came as a solution since they're saying it's going to be a dilution, right? So it came as a solution of like, say, you know, 100 milligrams per mil. And you have to dilute it down to one milligram per mil, for example. Right, so the first thing here, one of the first thing here is you need to have a, a chemical, a commercially available standard, right? Well, the other thing you have to have is some kind of pipette or syringe right here to use, right? Which is another source of uncertainty, right? To actually pipette out the value or syringe out the volume of liquid or water you need to make the dilution itself, right? And then the other one is the volumetric flask, right? Is the volumetric flask, okay? that you're going to use to, to keep your diluted solution in, right? And so both of these are uncertainty sources. You'll use this syringe right here to draw out some uh, volume of the commercial standard solution, right? And then you're going to squirt that into the volumetric flask and then fill it up to the line with the volume you want to get your de desired concentration, right? Say in milligrams per mil you're going from 100 milligrams per mil down to say one milligram per mil, right? So if you're looking at this, I wonder, you might be asking yourself, how do you have some kind of uncertainty source from a commercial standard? Well, remember that somebody like you, a person like you, right, had to go in and get some powder cocaine because cocaine doesn't come in a liquid, right? If you ever watch Narcos, right, it's actually like a powder. Um, uh, well, actually, it comes from like a plant, but then it come, becomes a powder. But, you know, that, that, that's besides the point, right? They have to make the solution, that standard solution, right? And so there's uncertainty in the weighing of the powder that they use. There's uncertainty in the liquid handling that they had. And all that stuff is actually tabulated and, and accounted for in the certificate of uh, analysis that they send along with the commercial standard. In there, it will have an uncertainty. All right, and you can call that an uncertainty source, right? Which contributes to uncertainty. As for the syringe that you're going to use to uh, to draw out the volume that you need to, uh, or also known as the V1, that you need to dilute to the V2 in the volumetric flask, right? Well, that syringe you're going to use also has an uncertainty associated with it right that you can find from the instruction manual or the certificate of solid calibration and then it also has uncertainty involved in it too from the operator error so there's going to be an uncertain budget normally with that syringe as well right and then all those things are also true with the volumetric flask right and so you can see how just doing one simple dilution m1 v1 equals m2 v2 requires all kinds of consideration when it comes to uncertainty sources okay well, <laughs> funny thing about that, 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 is, that, that is just a simple, a very simple fish bone diagram for a dilution. The actual, the actual fish bone diagram for a dilution is what you see down here, right? Where we have C1 right there, there's C2, right? There's V1 and there's V2, just like up there, except that somehow it got erased. 
So there's V2 right there, right? And so here, right, we have the syringe that we started with right here, right? This is this syringe right here. Wow. <laughs> it lists out on there, right, every single source of uncertainty that can be associated with using a syringe. Like the calibration of the syringe, like I was talking about. The cleanliness or the dryness of the syringe. The temperature uh, that you're using the syringe, because remember, temperature will change the volume of a liquid, right? Because the density of the liquid changes with temperature, okay? The, repeat the repeatability of using that syringe. That's the operator error part right there. Uh, there's actually two operator. There's the operator right there too. There's the operator error. And the, the, the fact that the operator has to be able to make repeated measurements on that syringe, right? And then as for the commercially available standard, of course, there's the report uncertainty that comes from the manufacturer, like from the certificate analysis, right? And then also temperature again, because temperature affects volume because density changes with temperature. And then evaporative loss because it's a solution, right? And that solution means that that cocaine powder, right? The standard was dissolved in water. And when you open up the lid, the water starts to evaporate. And so you're not even sure if that is a true concentration or it might be actually a little bit more concentrated than what you thought you got when you bought it because, uh, you know, it got delivered on a hot day or something, okay? And so a lot of it got evaporated, okay? So you can see how much is involved in just the M1, V1 part, which is this right here, right? This is the, the M1, V1 part, right? Now let's talk about the V2 part. <laughs> Again, repeatability from the operator, right? Just know how to use a, 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 a volumetric flask, okay? Temperature again affects density, which affects volume. The cleanliness of the flask and the calibration of the flask. You gotta make sure that the volumetric flask, um, the volumetric flask has a, uh, doesn't have any, uh, uh, does, is minimal in, in, in calibration error, or sorry, has been calibrated correctly so that the laser etched line for the volume of the volumetric flask is as close to the true value as possible. So all those things are involved, right? All those sources of uncertainty are involved in just doing one simple dilution, right? So my head is actually covering uh, something else here that I want you to see. Let me move my head real quick. There we go. So on the right now, uh, what you see is the the Fishbone diagrams that are involved in uh, in measuring a mass and also quantification of amphetamine, right? So measuring mass, <laughs> you should be super aware of that now, right? And so this will be the Fishbone diagram that you will use for the uncertainty budget that you're creating for the balances that you use, right, in the lab. So you did, you did, you did this already, right? You did this in, in lab already. Most of you have already done, finished this part already, except for the measurement assurance of the salt, right? But when I ask you in the lab report to provide me a fishbone diagram for the, uh, for the uh, uh, sources of uncertainty for a balance, this is what it is right here, right? Measuring a mass. And what do you measure mass with? It's a balance, right? So of course, there's a there's uncertain one uncertain source is the instrument itself. And you know, we've talked about this already, right? In the instruction manual, you can get the readability of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, of the balance, right? How many decimal points it has. You can get the linearity of the the from the instruction manual. You can also get the calibration from the instruction manual. That's actually what you, uh, 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 provided by a certificate of calibration. And then the repeatability there is you, right? Doing the repeated measurements of the uh, of the uh, standard weights, right? Environment again can always affect, uh, can always be a source of uncertainty because temperature, right? Again affects the uh, affects the uh, the density of an object, right? Static electricity, oh my God, for balance all the time, right? If you're weighing something super light, static electricity will make the the powder stick to your uh, stick to your weigh boat or stick to your scupula, right? So that's a pain. And then also air movement will actually cause vibrations in the balance itself and that will cause some uncertainty as well. Of course, again, operator and procedure, right? Which means basically euphemism for operator error, right? Making sure your balance is level, which I did that for you already, right? And also uh, off-center loading. So off-center loading is when, uh, for example, in our lab that you're doing right now, I tell you, I showed, I put in the procedure where you have to put those, weigh those uh, standard weights in different zones of the balance, right? Zone one, two, three, four, five, right? And so when you 
choose a zone that's not balanced, not in the center, that's how you take into account off-center loading of the balance, right? That's why I, I make you do that. I don't just say put the put the, the the certified weight right onto the balance in the center. No, I say uh, you know the, the 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 Excel file indicates which zone you need to put it in, right? So we can take into account any errors that are associated with uh, off uh, off center loading of the balance, right? And then <laughs> buoyancy, <laughs> things that are floating, right? The sample buoyancy, all that is associated, all those sources are associated then with measuring mass uncertainty, right? So when I ask you to, again, in the report, provide me a fishbone diagram for the uh, uh, the balance that you did the uncertainty measurement budget on, this is what I expect to see, this kind of fishbone diagram. And, 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 and I mean, you need to be able to uh, uh, spell out each and every uh, source, right? Each and every source, which is lucky for you because it's right here in the PowerPoint. Okay. But I'm also going to ask you to, I'm also going to ask you to, um, provide a fishbone diagram for the volume, uh, for the volume testing too, with the, the different, uh, pipetters, right? And the different serological pipettes and the burette too. And you have here the, the, uh, uh, an example for the measuring of mass, right? But you're going to have to come up with your own for, uh, measuring uh, a volume with a pipette, right? And you have the examples here that can help you. For example, here we have the quantification of of crystal meth, right? So in the in the, in the forensic lab, right? Uh, we have to sometimes quantify how much drugs are present in things, right? Like, like I told you before, we use that a lot, you know, to determine whether or not someone is going to be uh, charged with uh, trafficking or with possession, right? And so look at the fishbone diagram here. That is just that is a, that, that, that's where quantifying how much methamphetamine is in a sample. I mean, it's a pretty complicated fishbone diagram. I'm not even going to go through all of it, right? Because that's just a, a pain, right? Just a pain. But look at this here. Here's an auto pipette. You'll be using that for the serological pipetters, right? Uh, here's a regular pipette right there, right? So you, there's a fishbone diagram right there just for a regular pipette. There's a fishbone diagram right here, just for a flask, right? <laughs> and so uh, here's another fishbone diagram for a pipette right there, right? So parts of this fishbone diagram already have in there what you need to construct a fishbone diagram for uh, the uh, uncertainty uh, sources of uh, your four, uh, four micropipetters that you're testing two serological pipettes that you're testing, and the burette, okay? If you have any questions, let me know. Okay, so I'm going to come back now. So this right here is a blank uncertainty budget, right? And you can see over here, we have uncertainty sources, right? And we'll, we'll talk about what goes into each one of those columns in just a second. You Here, you you categorize whether or not it's a type A or type B source. Again, type A sources are usually ones that involve some kind of human intervention, uh, some uh, statistical analysis or standard deviation that's based on co data collection from some human, right? Whereas type B is usually a, uh, a value that's, uh, that's obtained from instruction manuals or calibration certificates or certificates of analyses, okay? Unless otherwise stated. Excuse me. Then the standard deviation that was actually um, uh, uh, the standard deviation for the type A uncertainty, right? That was actually calculated from that data point or outer limits, right? That are from um, like readability or, or linearity uh, from the instruction manual of an instrument, okay? Distribution model, that's rectangular or, or normal. And of course, again, uh, if you have a type A, it's a normal distribution. And if it's a type B, it's a... Uh, 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 rectangular distribution, okay? And so this is the part I was talking about earlier, the divisor. How do you know what the divisor is? Well, for type A, most commonly, the, oh, I didn't mean to write that. Type A, I'm sure I can get this, I promise. Type A, there we go. If it's the type A, a certainty source, then normally it is a divisor of one, okay? And then if it's a type B, it's an, it is the square root of three. Okay, the square root of three. Hmm? All right. 
The other thing to notice here too, uh, and I'll show you how, sorry, before I get, go further, I'll show you how those divisors play into the, the, the uncertainty budget in just a second, right? But I also want you to see down here, right? We, I, I said already in lab many times, and I want you to be clear about this now, for the vast majority of the, 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 the measurements you take, uh, you're going to be using a standard, a confidence level of 95%, right? Or K2, or sorry, or a K equals two which is the same thing as two deviations, two standard deviations from the mean, right? And we'll talk about that in a second. There are some times when you'll see that the, the confidence level is 99% or the confidence level is 60 something percent, but we will always use 95%, okay? And 95% corresponds to K equals two, and that equals two standard deviations from the mean. That's how comfortable we are saying that we are, uh, our number is, or a value that we value, that we measured uh, is that close to the mean, okay? So, oops, let's talk about some generalized sources of uncertainty, right? Of course, sampling can be a source of uncertainty. Storage conditions can be a source of uncertainty. Instrument effects, right? That's like defects, basically. Measurement conditions, the environment, the, the, the uh, temperature, right? <laughs> Operator effects, again, right? That's just a euphemism for saying human error, okay? And then random effects, right? And that's the thing that gets to be uh, minimized by the more um, data points you take. So, for example, if we, so let's just narrow this down then to having a forensic science type of example where we're doing mass determinations. And so I use this as an example because you're going to do a lot of mass determinations uh, in class, in lab, right? Because a lot of the stuff we're going to be doing is you're going to be weighing things on the balance, which is the reason why for you're doing an uncertainty, uh, a measurement budget on a balance to begin with, a balance that you'll be using for the whole semester, okay? And so for mass determinations, the specific sources of uncertainty are the repeatability of uh, certified measurement weights, right? Which you're doing that right now in lab when you're measuring all those certified weights over and over and over again in different zones on the balance. The temperature, of course, affects it. That's why you had to write that down in the in the Excel file where you collected the data. The humidity can affect it. Airflow, I've said that already before. Airflow can cause vibrations, which also are a source of uncertainty and a balance, right? Vibrations from a centrifuge. Luckily for us, we don't have any centrifuges that are sitting next to our balances. The weighing vessel, which is the either if you use the weigh boat or if you use weigh paper. Some people use like the aluminum ones. Those have a, a little bit of uncertainty involved in them too. How level the balance is. If you look at our balances, you'll see a little ball level at the very right next to the numbers. And the little, little air bubble inside is always going to be inside the circle. If it's not inside the circle, then your balance is unlevel and your measurements are very unreliable. The tolerance of the balance, that is a number that can be found on the instruction manual of the balance. Measurement assurance reappeatability. This is the part of the experiment or the part of the, the uh, uncertainty budget calculation where you are going right through right now, measuring out uh, predetermined masses of salt, right? And so what that's doing is that it's, uh, uh, it's assuring that the operator, you, are capable of measuring out uh, stated weights multiple times without too much variation. Okay, so that's what that is. That is measurement assurance repeatability. Okay, transport uh, transportation of the balances. Uh, we don't move the balances at all. Uh, we try not to move the balances. But if you were in a, uh, a a government lab, right, or an industrial lab, and you had a balance and you moved that balance, you would have to go through this entire process again of doing uncertainty because balances will act differently in different locations, right? And so. Luckily, we're in an academic setting. If I move a balance and it's level, it's probably good to go. I don't want you to have to go through and do an uncertainty of <laughs> measurement budget every single time we move a balance, right? But we're not going to worry. So we're not going to worry about that now. But just know, though, that in, in a government lab or in an industrial lab, if you move a balance, you will have to go through and do an uncertainty budget, also known as a validation, right, of that balance every time you move the balance, okay? <laughs> the user, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> Again, a euphemism for operator error, right? So readability of the balances is something we've already talked about, of course, which is the number of places, decimal places the balances have. And so an analytical balance has four decimal places, right? It's, it measures all the way to 0 0.0001, whereas a uh, precision balance only goes to 0 0.001. That's the readability of the balance. That's also reported in the, uh, in the instruction manual of the balance, right? And then uh, the last one that's there is the uncertainty of the weight standard, right? And the uncertainty of the weight standard is actually the, 
the uncertainty that is associated with the actual standard weight itself. And remember how I was talking about traceability, right? Well, traceability, uh, how it plays into this is that a standard, a certified standard weight, right, will be traceable back to another standard weight at uh, the national level. For example, the one at the National Institute of Science and Technology, right? And the one there is as close as we can get to the actual true value of, say, one kilogram, right? Just to be clear about what's, what's going on here, right, is that you have your 50 gram weight. And actually, I have one right here. Now that I think about it. You have your 50 gram weight, which, by the way, I'm touching with my fingers because it's hard to show you with tweezers. Don't ever do this. You always use tweezers. But here's a 50 gram weight. Well, how do I know this thing was a 50 gram weight? Well, I have another 50 gram weight that I know was a f that, that's 50 grams, and I compare them to each other, right? And when I compare them to each other, I can see how much this weight is off from this weight, the, the, the other weight, right? And so this is the standard weight, the one that's not, I'm not holding anything, the standard weight. And this is the weight that you have. And the uncertainty would be how off, right, or how, how much doubt there is, right, uh, that this weight here, the one that, that you're using, uh, is close to the, um, uh, the standard weight, okay? And so then you're asking yourself, well, how do you know that that standard weight that you're using to reference with your own weight is 50 grams. Well, that standard weight was referenced and compared to another weight, right? That's also said to know, to be 50 grams. And then to another weight, and to another weight, all the way up to the weight in at NIS that is known to be as close to 50 grams as we can possibly get, right? And so, and each time that we can make a comparison between, two, between a weight and another standard, right? Uh, we, we there's uncertainty involved there, right? And that uncertainty is taken into account when it when you, they, they calculate the uncertainty for the weight standard that you're using in the lab now, right? And honestly, I don't know how many times they have to reference it. Sometimes people will actually send these weights straight to NIST, and so there's only one reference time, right? Where you you, uh, you you your weight is referenced directly to or compared directly to the weight at NIST, and so there's only one one chain, you know, one degree of separation between the, the the reference weight at NIST and your weight that you're using. So some people actually do that, right? But some people will send these weights to like a calibration company and then the calibration company will compare it to their standard weight, which their standard weight was then sent to the uh, one to NIST where it was compared to the reference weight at NIST. And so now there's two degrees of separation between the, the traceability, right? So of course the best thing to do is to have it is to is to have it the the standard weight compared directly to the one at NIST, but that sometimes that's untenable. And so there's a myriad of of different companies around the the uh, the, the metroplex and all over the country that will do that kind of thing for you. And so they'll compare your weights to the uh, the reference standards that they have, but you can trust that their reference standards were actually compared to the ones at uh, at NIST. Right and uh, the National Institute of Science and Technology uh, to be uh, as close to the true value as possible. And if there's any deviation from that, that deviation is then calculated into the uncertainty of the weight and it's given to you in a certificate and it tells you exactly what it is. And you'll see that in the, uh, you'll see in our, uh, in the, uh, uh, in Blackboard, right, I have the certificate for your weights, right? Actually, let's go take a look at them real quick. I'm going to go ahead and keep that, and I'm going to open Blackboard right there. And so if you go into Blackboard, and under, I think it's Lab Modules, and then Uncertainty Measurement, uh, nope, not Uncertainty Measurement, I forgot, we're actually going to be in the Important Lab Documents, right, Instruction Manuals and Certificates, and under that, right here, we have the OS, OHAS, or OHAS, however you say it, uh, standard weights testing, uh, tested weights calibration certificate. And so I mentioned the company Tromner, right? They're a very, very big company when it comes to doing weight calibrations and, and things like that. And as you can see, if we scroll down here, we have a list of weights and what their uncertainties are, right? Uh, and so you see uncertainty right here. I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see it a little bit better. All right, see here's true mass as found, as left, density of the weight, and its uncertainty. 
Uh, so this one is actually true mass in a vacuum. You're not going to be using that. Why? Because <laughs> you're not weighing the, 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 the standard weight in a vacuum, are you? You're just putting it on a on a balance, right? Oh, let me move my head out of the way so you can actually see the numbers. Sorry about that. There we go. So you can actually see the numbers, right? So we're not using that one. The next one here, here we go. This is the mass in air calibration value and reference density of 8,000 kilograms. Don't worry about that but I think this would be the one you're using. Ah, see here, we have the uncertainty and we have the tolerance right there, right? And uh, let me see what the next one is. This is the correction, right? Uh, and so we don't actually need the correction. And this is the calibration. Okay, so what you're gonna be using as your values in the uncertainty budget are gonna be these values here, the air in, the mass and air calibration, which is what you have, what you're doing right now, right? And you see here, so for example, again, I'm, I'm picking this thing up with a 50, I'm picking this up, this 50 gram weight up with my fingers. Don't do that. Use tweezers, right? I'll have to clean this when I'm done, right? I'm going to bring myself back so you can see that I'm holding it, right? This is a 50 gram weight. So here we are at 50 grams right there, right? And if I scroll over right here, I can see the tolerance and the uncertainty of the 50 gram weight right here, right? So the uncertainty is plus or minus. 0 0.24 milligrams so that's not that bad i have a 50 gram weight and uh, when i use it it's got an uncertainty of 0 0.024 milligrams which is actually very very tiny uh, but i'll tell you that trometer has standards that are even smaller in uncertainty than that and then they were compared to the standards at nist which have even smaller uncertainty than that right so that's what we mean by traceability this weight uh, was compared to the one at trometer right and came up with this uncertainty right there and the one at Trommer was then compared to the one at, at NIST and it had even smaller uncertainty uh, because the one at NIST uh, is, the, is, the, is the truest uh, weight we have in the country. Uh, the, the international weight standard, by the way, I mentioned before is in France, right? That one's the closest one. Uh, and I believe the, the kilogram weight that they have in France or in Paris uh, is uh, for a one kilogram weight is 0 0.9999999996 or something like that. Like super close. It's only off by like, I can't even tell you. It's really, really, really close. Anyway, so that's how you would figure that out. So let's go back to the PowerPoint real quick. There we go. And so if you look at the PowerPoint here, right, uh, you can see that um, the four, or I guess the five, the five, the five uh, uncertainty sources that we'll be using for the, the uh, uncertainty budget of the balances are these five right here. The balance repeatability, the tolerance, the uncertainty, right, the measurement assurance repeatability, and the balance repeat readability, right? And so these are not the exact weights I told you to use. These are just example weights. But for example, the balance repeatability is you, right? You here are weighing the certified weight, which is supposed to be a certain weight, right? On the balance to see what you get. That's balance repeatability. So you did have to do a point 0.1. You did have to do a 1. And you did also have to do a 10. But instead of doing a, uh, we didn't have 100, so you went to 50 here. But you also had to do a 0 0.001, I think. 0 0.01. So yeah. Right, so different weights, but the same thing goes here, right? The tolerance, that's the tolerance that you found for each weight on the trauma certificate, right, that I just showed you. The uncertainty of each weight found on the trauma certificate, as I showed you, right? And then the measurement assurance repeatability here is the masses that I asked you to uh, measure out in salt, right? The masses that I measure, that I asked you to measure out in salt on each balance to ensure that you, the person, the operator are capable of measuring the same mass over and over and over again, right? And so it says here, measurement assurance, 10 grams, 100 grams, and 200 grams. I, I don't remember what, what I asked you to do in the procedure. I think it was maybe one gram, uh, 10 grams, and 100 grams, something like that, I can't remember. And then of course, the readability of the, uh, of the balance, right? And <laughs> the reason why there's actually two readability, <coughs> excuse me. The reason why there's two readabilities here is because that's a typo. It should actually say readability and uh, readability and uh, and linearity actually. So let me fix that. 
But the one that you have in Blackboard is actually blank. So you can type in whatever you want. And you need to type in there linearity. Okay, linearity, right? And so, and then for uh, and then for these, you had the the point zero, the point one, the one, the ten. The, you did not have a one hundred. You actually had a fifty because we didn't have a weight that went up to a hundred, right? And then instead of three hundred grams, you actually had the point zero one gram as well, right? Same thing here, right? This was this was actually fifty. And then this one was 0 0.01, right? Same thing here. This one should have been 50 grams. And this one should have been 0 0.01. And of course, I want you to make it look nice. So move the 0 0.01 up here, right? Put it at the top. And so that you're going in descending order okay? of the weights, okay? And then for the measurement assurance, I'm actually, let me go look up and see what I asked you to do there. Keep, we'll go to the, we'll go to the uh, blackboard and go to the lab, lab modules, uncertainty measurement, uncertainty measurement lab. And so, um, There it is right there. Yeah. So I asked you to do 100, 10, and then, sorry, 1, 10, and 100, right? So if we go back to the blank one here. For you, this will be the 1 gram for salt, 10 grams of salt and then 100 grams of salt okay so that's basically what yours is going to look like when you put your when you make yours right all right so let's keep on going here so just uh, i've already gone through all these but we'll go through it one more time uh the certified rate re weight repeatability this is literally you uh going in and measuring the standard weights on the balance to see what you get this is a type a distribution right here right type a uh type a source of uncertainty and so, since it's a type A source of uncertainty, you're going to have a uh, you're going to have a uh, normal distribution with that. Okay, uh, and so that would be that would result then in a divisor of one. Okay, and so uh, again, uh, we said this already before. Traceable to NIST. Whoops, sorry. I wonder why I changed it there. Right, traceable to NIST. Uh, and then the one after uh, weight repeatability was the tolerance. That was the one that you found on the calibration certificate of the weight itself, right? And so uh, that's a type B because it's from a calibration certificate. And so this one would be a type B or a rectangular distribution, meaning it's gonna have a uh, divisor of the square root of three. Oh, so I should write that. So type A evaluation means divisor of one. And then type B means divisor. Oops, how do you spell divisor? I just spelled it a second. Divisor, uh, oh, I spelled it wrong up here. <laughs> okay, divisor, there we go. Divisor of the square root of three, okay? For type Bs, okay? Because this was the normal distribution, right? The curve that looked like this. Oh, terrible. There we go. Whereas this is the rectangular distribution. And the curve looked like this, right? Okay, so, oh, this is just another example of the trauma certificate. And um, you saw this uh, already. This is only, this one only lists one weight. It's a four kilogram weight. That's another huge, right? But notice here, it says here, traceable to NIST, right? And it tells you what the NIST test number was. Um, and so trauma does that for us, right? Uh, we don't have to actually send our weights to NIST. You can send them to trauma and trauma will deal with it for us, right? But then again, so it's a four kilogram weight. We're not using a four kilogram weight. I gave you the certificate that has your weights on it already. But again, here's the tolerances right here and the uncertainties, right? And so, uh, 
uh, and so there's this shows the traceability like I said before the red is a traceability of the thing and then the uncertainty is right here right in the blue box okay so those are the things that you will fit into the uh, uh, in the uh, the uncertainty is what you will fit into the uh, uh, um, uncertainty budget okay all right so measurement assurance this is the type a this is the one where I ask you to measure the one gram, the 10 gram, and the 100 gram samples of salt to see if you, as the operator, are capable of doing that, right? And getting as close to those numbers as possible. That's a type A distribution, which means, or type A uh, source. And so that means you'll have a normal distribution. So your divisor here is one. And I'll, again, I'll tell you what that means in a second, where you put those numbers in a second, right? And then the balance repeatability, right? That definitely comes from the instruction manual, like I said before. Okay, and this is going to be a type B. Type B? Oh, you can't even see what I'm writing. Let me fix that. This is going to be a type B. Okay, that's a type B, which means it's rectangular, right? Which means that it'll have a divisor of the square root of 3. We'll show you where that goes in a second. So, this is a completed. Uh, this is a completed uh, uncertainty uh, of uh, measurement budget for a balance. And as you can see, all of the previous categories of uncertainty sources that we just discussed are listed on the side uh, here. And so let's go through each one of these one at a time to see what they mean to you and uh, how they apply to your lab that you're working on as we speak. And so the first one let's talk about is the balance repeatability, right? The balance repeatability is you taking the standard weight that you have and putting it onto the balance and measuring its mass. You already know what the mass's label is, right? Or also known as a nominal mass of the weight, of the standard weight. Well, you, you take that balance, you take that weight and you put it on the balance and you measure that weight uh, 25 times, right? At different zones on the balance's weighing pan, of course, but it's still 25 times. And so that's what the balance repeatability measurement is. And so when you take a look at the data here from the, uh, uh, the, the balance repeatability, in this example, the weights that they used were a 0.1 gram, a 1 gram, 10 gram, 100 gram, and 300 gram. Uh, uh, a little different from what we did because we didn't have a 100 gram or a 300 gram, but we did do a 0 0.001 gram and a 50 gram, right? So basically the same thing, but just with different weights, which is perfectly fine. Well, each one of these, right, represents the weight being stated there being weighed 25 times at least, right? And then so we know then that balance repeatability is something that includes a human, you know, doing some kind of measurement, right? Or an operator doing some kind of measurement as they call it at ANAP. And since it is an operator involved source of error, right? We call that a, we consider the type A error. And type A errors have a normal distribution. And so when a type A error has a normal distribution, right, we can then say that the standard deviation from the 25 measurements of each one of these uh, weights uh, is actually going to be the same as a standard uncertainty. Uh, so if you forgot about that, recall from several slides ago how I said that whenever we have a normal distribution, the standard uh, uncertainty uh, can also be the standard deviation, or I think I said it the other way around. I said the standard deviation can also be the standard uncertainty. And so that's what we have here in this case with the balance repeatability uh, and the standard deviations that are associated with each one of the weights uh, data sets, right? And so where does the divisor come in? Well, since we know that the standard deviation on a normal distribution uh, from a type A, right, source, is also going to be the standard uncertainty. What that means then is that our divisor is going to be one because when you divide 0 0.000677 by one, you get the same number again. It's rounded up to uh, 0 0.00068, but it's still the same number, right? And so you can see that all these, excuse me, you can see that all these have a divisor of one because all their standard uncertainties will become the uh, the standard, sorry, all the standard deviations will become the standard uncertainties, right? Uh, uh, with just the exception of being rounded up in this, or being rounded in this case, right, to fewer decimal points, but they're still the same number, okay? 
Um, so let's take a look at the other. Uh, let's take a look at the other type A uncertainty source that we have, and that's going to be the measurement assur uh, assurance. The measurement assurance uh, repeatability. So how does this apply to what you're doing in lab? The measurement assurance repeatability is uh, when you're carrying out the procedure where you're weighing out the uh, set masses of one gram, 10 grams, and 100 grams of salt, right? And the purpose of this particular category, measurement assurance, is to ensure that the operator can repeatedly measure the same mass over and over and over again, right? And so these numbers here, even though they're not the same weights that you measured out from, or the same masses that you measured out from for the salt, right? It means the same thing, just different numbers, right? And so again, this standard deviation right here from uh, from the very first mass uh, was the 10 gram for that one, for this particular example, it's 10 grams. The standard deviation here is from 25 measurements or more, right, of a, of a mass, masses of 10 grams uh, of whatever powder they use to, to, to weigh out in, or, uh, in, in this uh, particular balance uh, uncertainty budget, right? It could have been anything. I mean, we chose salt because salt is benign and doesn't hurt anything, uh, but I, I'm not sure what they used as their, their solid to weigh out in their measurement assurance in this particular example. And so, again, since it's a type A, because it involves an operator uh, and some operator error, right? We have a normal distribution and we have a normal distribution. The standard uncertainty can be the standard, de uh, sorry, I keep on saying it backwards. The standard deviation can become the standard uncertainty, right? Or is the standard uncertainty. And so we have a divisor of one so that we get the same number again uh, when we apply the divisor, right? The 0 0.001042 divided by one is still 0 0.00104, right? Rounded to, rounded down to that number because uh, we just dropped the two and it got rounded down. But in any case, just be clear that these numbers are in effect the same as these numbers, right? And that's true of the normal distribution, right? Uh, when you are doing a, a type A uncertainty source, right? So the next one I want to talk about are the type B uncertainty sources. The first one is the tolerance. And so the tolerance here of the certified weight, right? That's given to you on the uh, given to you on the calibration certificate, and since you got it from the calibration certificate, it is known as a type B uncertainty source. And uh, with uh, unless otherwise stated, right, a type B uncertainty source will have a rectangular distribution, and will have a divisor of the square root of three. And so in this case, we have our uncertainty, uh, sorry, uncertainty tolerance, right, of the first weight, the 0.1 gram weight, right here. Uh, the tolerance of the 0.1 gram weight being 0 0.000, 0 0.0001, right? And we divide it by the square root of 3, and that's how we get the 0 0.00006, right? And just as a reminder, where do we get that from? Let me go out, leave real quick, and go to Blackboard and show you where we got that value from, right? Uh, so here it is right here. We are looking at the mass in air calibration data versus the density just this real quick in case you uh we've forgotten how we've gotten there right if you go under oh, i guess i got logged out of blackboard and we log back in okay so under our course right uh under important lab documents uh we go to uh the instrument manuals and certificates and here we have the ohas standard weights uh standard test weights calibration certificate and we'll scroll down once again down to where we have the uh, uh, mass and air calibration value, right? And I'll zoom in a little bit here. And so for our point one, uh, for our point one gram standard weight, right? For uh, for their example, for their example, their point one standard weight had a tolerance of. Let's go back and look real quick because I can't remember. Uh, right here. So for their point one in this example, their point one gram certified weight, their tolerance was point uh, zero 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 one, right? So three zeros and a one. Okay. Um, grams. Okay. So uh, I guess that would be then. Uh, so that's one milligram there. So that's point one milligrams. Okay. So point one milligrams. So but we look at ours. 
0.1 grams is the same thing as 100 milligrams, which is right here, right? And we'll scroll over and look at the tolerance there. All right, oops, sorry. I'm gonna to try to make it, so this is, this column right here on the far right here is tolerance. And there it is right there, right? I have it highlighted. Let's see if I can make this go up a little higher so my head isn't blocking it. Right. There we go. So this is uh, uh, 100 milligrams is the same thing as 0.1 grams, right? And then the tolerance for our 0.1 grams is going to be right here, which is 0 0.01 milligrams, right? So uh, comparing that to... It's actually, I think that's actually the same. I already forgot what number it was in the example. <laughs> uh, so for them, theirs was 0.1 milligrams in their example, and in ours, is 0 0.01 milligrams so our weight was actually even better tolerance than uh, uh, a smaller tolerance than uh, than the weight that's in the example interesting very interesting so that's the number you'll use for the tolerance right that's the number you you that you will use for the tolerance okay so let's go back to the PowerPoint and keep on going there we go and so, just as a quick reminder, right, our tolerance is indeed a type B, right? And so, since it's the tolerance is a type B, uh, we do the rectangular distribution, which, is, uh, which, if it is not otherwise stated, is a divisor of square root of, of 3. And that's how we get the standard uncertainty then for a uh, standard uncertainty then for the... Uh, 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 for that type of type B or, or that type B uh, uncertainty source, right? And then the other normal type B uncertainty source we have would be the readability in this example. And so if we go down here to balance readability, that's also a type B right here, right? And so again, the readability of a balance can be uh, found in the instruction manual of the balance. And uh, I think what's happening here for you guys, I definitely want you, like I said before, to have this to be linearity, if that's available uh, in the instruction manual. Uh, but for this one here, they have two readabilities, and the reason why they have two readabilities is because the balance that they were uh, they were uh, validating in this one, making an uncertainty budget for this example, uh, had uh, was capable of reading both. Uh, uh, three places and two places, right? It could be a top loading balance and it could also be uh, 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 a uh, precision balance. Um, but our balances, at least at least for two of your groups, right? Two of our groups, uh, two of you groups, <laughs> uh, were went all the way to four place balances. So that was the analytical balance. So that's that's a that's a, an important distinction to be made. And so anyway, again, type B balances, right? Or sorry, type B sources means rectangular distributions, right? Readability found in the instruction manual. Uh, let's just make sure that we know where that is real quick. Keep. And then we'll go back to Blackboard. Go back out here to instruction manuals. So I think that uh, the there are a couple groups that had the PX series, right? And so, yeah, they had this one which, with a four-place balance. And, uh, yeah. And we can scroll all the way down to the balance specifications. It's not a very long instruction manual, so we should get the specifications pretty soon. Lots of instructions here. Almost there. Almost there. Really, I should just scroll instead of using the scrolling wheel. Okay, we're almost there. I know we're almost there. Also because we're getting to the bottom here. Maintenance. 
Science uh, technical data. I think we're almost there. Ah, here we are. So I believe the balances that we have in the lab that are four place balances are this one right here, the PX224. Uh, uh, don't quote me on that though. Make sure you're looking at the balances little label to make sure that the uh, you have the right model number. But I think they're PX224s, and you can see here the readability right here, which is 0 0.0001 four place balance. Then you also have the linearity here, which is 0 0.0002, and so those would be the two numbers that I would want you to put into the type B source right for readability and linearity for your balance if you use a different balance from this you'll have a very similar table that will have that information in it okay and again those are type b sources so when we're looking at our calibration not calibration sorry looking at our our uh, uncertainty budget right here right they're going to have a rectangular distribution and thus a rectangular distribution unless otherwise stated uh, sorry, uh, that's with a rectangular uh, distribution. You're going to have the divisor be the square root of 3 right here, okay? The square root of 3. And so, of course, all you would do is you would take the, for the bottom number, for example, it would be 0 0.01 divided by the square root of 3, and that's how you get that number right there. And the same thing with the number above it, okay? So the last type of uh, uncertainty we have here that I want to go over is a little bit tricky. And it's, be, it's tricky because... This is the uncertainty of the certified weight standard. Now, remember, we get the uncertainty of the certified weight standard from a calibration certificate. You saw it already when we had the calibration certificate open. We'll go back to it in just a second to show it to you, right? But just by the, the fact that we get the information from a calibration certificate makes that a type B source, right? It didn't involve uh, uh, reading that number off a calibration certificate. did not involve... Uh, uh, an operator going to do any measurements and so that's why that's going to be a type B measurement right or a type B source okay and so what we need to do then is go back to the calibration certificate and it's from the calibration certificate that we get the information that we put here for the standard deviation right or the outer outside limits the distribution and the divisor okay and this may look a little confusing to you because I, I've been telling you that type B's are rectangulars a rectangular distribution and they have a square root of three right and then i told you the type a uh, has a normal distribution and has a square has the divisor of one but here we have a type b that has a normal distribution that doesn't seem right right and it has a divisor of two i never mentioned two before right well that's because this particular category is a little bit special right and it's a little bit special again because like i said we get the value from a calibration certificate, but it didn't involve us as an operator doing any kind of measurements or any kind of statistical analysis, right? But when we look at the certificate, right, it gives you it gives us information about the fact that there was measurements that have been done, right? And a statistical analysis was done, right, uh, uh, to give us the uh, standard deviations, right, or its uncertainty. And so, uh, so this is a combination of both. It's a type B uncertainty source because we read it off of a uh, of a calibration certificate, right? But when we read the calibration certificate, it tells us, though, that to get that uncertainty, a statistical analysis was done over measurements, uh, and, and it also told us uh, what the K value was or what K is equal to or the coverage factor was, right? And so let me show you what I'm talking about here. So let's keep this again and go back to our calibration certificate. Uh, so back to instrument manuals and certificates. And if you look at the weight right here, right? Uh, look at the weight certificate and we'll go back to the one that we want to use, which is the mass and air calibration value. And again, we'll take a look at, let's just look at the, the biggest one we have, which is 50 grams, right? And when we look at 50 grams, we see here that the uncertainty is 0 0.24, 0 0.24 milligrams, right? Plus or minus. And on the face of it right there, it looks like, you know, uh, just a normal number that you would pull from a calibration certificate that you would use as a type B source, right? But in fact, it's not that simple, right? 
And when you zoom in, right, let me zoom in here, you can actually see that that the tolerances, right, are actually very round numbers. They always end in zero, whereas uncertainty numbers always end in something different. And so it's variable. And the reason why is because somebody, it may not have been you, the operator, but if somebody maybe at Traumer was doing the calc the uh, doing the measurements, right, and they did a statistical analysis, and so they purported to you this uncertainty that was a normal distribution, right? <laughs> Had you done it, it would be an A source, right? But uh, a type A source. But since someone else did it and it was read to you or you got the information from a calibration surrogate, it is a B source. But since these calibration certificate got it from a statistical analysis, we have to use a different distribution. It can't be a rectangular distribution, right? Because the data then certainly was actually obtained from a statistical analysis. And so how do we know what the rectangular distribution we need to use? Well, this is not one of those cases where the standard deviation is going to be the uh, uncertainty, right? Because this uncertainty here that's listed on the calibration certificate is actually the expanded uncertainty, right? Uh, and so <laughs> if it's an expanded uncertainty, we need to figure out how it was expanded, right? Whereas before, when we had a type A source, the standard deviation was in fact the un standard uncertainty, right? That's why we just divided it by one and we would get the same number again. But since this is a stand, this, since this is a, uh, on the calibration certificate, this is a expanded uncertainty, we have to figure out how, uh, what the actual original uh, standard uncertainty is, right? And how do we figure that out? Well, it's all dependent on what, it's all dependent on what the K value is, right? Or what the K is equal to, or the coverage factor is. And so if you scroll down to the very bottom right here, right? you can see there's some definitions in this uh, certificate. And you look at, for example, here we go. Here's the definition of uncertainty. And it says right here that the uncertainty that's reported by this certificate is a standard deviation that's associated with the result of a measurement that is characterized by dispersion of values that could reasonably be attributed to the measurement, right? So there we go. Right here it says the uncertainty is, is, is the result of a statistical measurement, right? So since, uh, or statistical analysis. And so since it says that, it's gotta be a normal distribution, okay? It's gotta be a normal distribution. But since we got it from a certificate, it's still a type B source. So let's keep on reading. Uh, the uncertainty is calculated in accordance with the NIST, National Institute of Science and Technology, Tech Note 1297 UKAS M3003. We don't care about all that. Well, all we care about is this part right here. The coverage factor of the statistical analysis is a K equals two, right? Or also known as an interval of having a, an interval of having a confidence level of approximately 95%, okay? And so what that means is that the uncertainty here that is reported is an expanded uncertainty and was a result of an analysis, a statistical analysis that, uh, involved a coverage factor of two, right? Which is great. What that means then is that we can go back to the standard uncertainty from this reported expanded uncertainty by just dividing by two. So what that means then is our divisor is two. And so, and we'll talk even more about coverage factors in a second because we need to do our own coverage factor or, or, or state our own coverage factor uh, in our uncertainty budget. but. So now that we found out in this certificate here that it's the coverage factor of two, we know now that we know now that to get from the expanded uncertainty to the uh, standard uncertainty, we need to divide the uh, expanded uncertainty reported by the certificate by by two, right? If the if the k was equal to three, then we would have to divide by three. The divisor would be three to get back to the standard uncertainty, right? If the k if the uh, the K equal one, right? Much like it is in normal type A sources, then it would just be the divisor is one. And then the the the, uh, the standard deviation, or sorry, the standard uncertainty is the standard uncertainty, right? So we wouldn't have to do anything at all. But it's stated here in the calibration certificate that the K is two, so our divisor will be two. And so going back to the uh, PowerPoint in our example here,
sorry, whenever I go back to the PowerPoint, I always have to get everything set up so I can actually write again. There we go. And so, as you can see here, for this uh, uncertainty uh, of the certified weight that we have right here, right? Again, we, since we got it from a calibration certificate, it's still a type B, right? But the calibration certificate reported that it was actually a normal distribution, right? And so, and it also reported that the normal distribution uh, was, uh, was, uh, 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 had a coverage factor, sorry, evolved a coverage factor of two, right? And so that's why two is our divisor. And so now we know from that, that the coverage factor being two, we know that if we take the, this is the expanded uncertainty right here, right? Reported by the calibration certificate. If we take that and divide it by two, then we'll get the standard uncertainty, right? So it's easy. Right, we get the standard uncertainty from the expanded uncertainty by dividing it by its coverage factor, right? So that's 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 all it is, and then we can get back to the expanded uncertainty, which we'll need later, right? By multiplying the standard uncertainty by the coverage factor, right? So the coverage factor is very important, and we'll get to that in a minute. So as we go through all these uncertainties, everything from the 0.1 gram weight to the 100 gram weight. Had a normal distribution, of course, still still type B source because it came from a calibration certificate, but it's normal distribution, and they all had a coverage factor of two, so they all get divided by two. The divisor is two, and then that's how we got the start the standard uncertainties from their reported expanded uncertainties in their calibration certificates. For some reason here, <laughs> the the 300 gram weight. Uh, its coverage factor is one, so its divisor is one, and so it's basically the same number again. Okay, just like it would be if it were a normal type A source. And so that's how we figure out how to fill out a, uh, that's the steps in filling out a uh, uh, uncertainty budget, right? For a mass, I'm sorry, not a mass, but a balance, okay? So moving forward, the next step then is to calculate the combined standard uncertainty, right? The combined standard uncertainty. And so, the thing that, the way that we do that is by using the equation for the root sum of squares or the RSS. Okay, uh, and just as a quick reminder, when we're doing this for any kind of measuring device, whether it be a ruler or a balance or a pipetter, right? Every all those uncertainty sources and those standard deviations that come from those uncertainty sources need to be reported in all the same units. So since we're using a balance here, right? We're doing an uncertainty budget on a balance here. Every single one of those. A certain resources is is uh is in the unit of grams, right? Or or you know, I mean, if it were a really heavy duty balance, I guess we could go to kilograms. But they're all for this particular balance and our balance too. Uh, for this particular balance in this example and in our balance too, it's uh it's reported as grams and everything is reported as grams. So grams, kilograms, pounds for mass determinations, right? If we're if it were a volume determination, it would be mills. Makes sense, right? And then, as I was saying before. You know, the standard uncertainty is basically one standard deviation, right? When we have a normal distribution. And that's why the divisor is one. And so if you have a standard deviation, you divide it by the divisor of one, you get the standard uncertainty, okay? And so how do we then calculate the combined uncertainty? Again, we use the root sum of squares and that equation is this. And basically what this says is that the uh, uh, combined standard uncertainty is the square root of the square of the first uncertainty source, right? Or, or sorry, the square of the first standard uncertainty plus the uh, square of the second standard uncertainty plus the square of the next standard uncertainty and then all the rest of the standard squared of the standard uncertainties uh, until we have accounted for all of them, right? And so uh, the five different standard uncertainty sources or so let me say that again the five different sources of uncertainty that we identified are listed here below and each one of those had a standard uncertainty that was associated with it and so then when we plug that in into the uh when we plug that into the uh the equation this is what we get and let me actually move myself my head so you can see the full equation there right we have the square root then of the rsd of the rsd squared right rsd is the repeatability standard deviation right r for repeatability standard deviation repeatability standard deviation 
right? So the RSD squared plus the tolerance squared, check right there, plus the measurement assurance standard deviation squared. That's the one right here, check. For you guys, in your case, you are that is your standard deviation from the 25 times you measured out one gram of salt, the time you measured out 25 times the 10 grams of salt, and the time that you measured out 25 times the 100 grams of salt, right? And so that's that right there. Measurement, uh, uh, measurement assurance standard devi uh, deviation, right? The reutability, right, of the balance, which is right there, check, squared, plus the weight of the standard, sorry, the standard weight uncertainty, right, squared, which is uh, the one that we pulled from the uh, from the calibration certificate, which is weird, which is the weird one because though it is a B source of uncertainty, like a type B source of uncertainty, it still has a normal distribution because that's what was reported on the calibration certificate. Okay, and so, and let me bring myself back so you can see me, right? We actually got multiple standard deviations for each category. Remember, right? Let me go back to here real quick. We had multiple standard deviations for repeatability, uh, balance repeatability for tolerance, for the uncertainty of the standard weights, for the repeatability of the me measurement assurance, and for the balance readability, right? So which one do we pick? Or how do we incorporate all those into the RSS equation, right? The root sum squared equation. Well, if you take a look at what's Sorry, I need to get back to our slide. There we go, right? If you if you uh, if you take a look at what it says here, right? It says same effect, same time, right? And so what we're trying to say, or what we're trying to get across on this particular slide, is the fact that you took all those measurements, right? Uh, for for example, the standard weights, and you took all those measurements for all those uh, uh, salt, right? All those salt uh, uh, pre predetermined salt uh, masses, right? You also uh, uh, took all the uh, measured the masses of all those or you are going to uh, of all those volumes from the pipetters and stuff right and you did them all at the same time okay and so when you have things done at the same time you have the same effect right and so it turns out that the most conservative way to account for all those different things uh, uh, in when you're doing the experiment all at the same time is by using the largest value right the largest standard uncertainty value uh, from each category, okay? So the largest value from the, uh, the largest value from the, uh, from the uh, RSD goes in there, right? The largest uh, standard uncertainty from the tolerance goes in there. The largest standard uncertainty from the mass assurance goes in there. The largest uncertainty standard uh, standard uncertainty from the readability goes there, and the largest from the uh, weight standard uncertainty goes there, right? So you don't actually have to combine all of those those standard deviations or standard uncertainties, right, uh, and then put them into the RSS equation. You just have to pick the biggest one from each category, the largest value from each category. And that principle is the same effect, same time principle, right? Okay, and like I said, this is the most conservative approach by using the largest value, okay, the largest value there. So after we have uh, calculated the combined standard uncertainty, then we need to calculate the expanded uncertainty, correct? And so that would be the next step. Well, how do we do that, right? Well, we've actually already alluded to this before, and let me move my head out of the way so you can see the whole slide, right? Remember when we had the type B source of uncertainty, uh, that was the uncertainty of the standard weights that we found from the calibration certificate. And since we got it from the calibration certificate, it was the, uh, it's, it's got to be a type B source, but this, the calibration certificate said it was actually, uh, uh, it was a, uh, a K equals two uh, coverage factor, right? From a statistical analysis, right? And so the way that we were able to go from that expanded uncertainty that was from the, the calibration certificate to get it back to a standard uncertainty so we could put it into our budget, right, was to uh, divide the uh, expanded uncertainty from the um, calibration certificate by the coverage factor, right, which is essentially two, and so the divisor was two. And so the uncertainty uh, from the, from the uh, calibration certificate for each of the weights 
was divided by 2, the 2 being the divisor, and that's how we got the standard uncertainty. Well, it's the same equation again, right, to get back to the expanded uncertainty. All you have to do is multiply the combined uncertainty times the k, right, or the coverage factor, okay? And like I've told you many times before, uh, the vast majority of statistical analyses will involve a 95% confidence level, okay? And a 95% confidence level corresponds to a k equals 2, right? And a k equals 2 corresponds to a, uh, a value that is two standard devia uh, uh, a value that is at maximum two standard deviations away from the mean, right? And so, uh, just as a, a general rule, we also make standard we also never have an extent, expand uncertainty that is more than two significant figures, right? Just you know, and we'll see that in play in just a second. Okay, so again, k equals two, coverage factor equal two equals two is a 95% confidence level, okay? So the two goes here, right? And then your combined uncertainty that you calculated from uh, from the RSS, the root sum squares equation from before, goes here, and that gets us our expanded uncertainty, okay? So taking a look at this uh, uh, example uh, again, right? Uh, in this example, the largest of the repeatability of the balance was chosen as the contributing factor here uh, to the combined uncertainty, right? Uh, the combined standard uncertainty in the RSS equation. And then this number here, that was the largest number there. So that was the one that was put in for tolerance in the RSS equation. The 0 .00006 there was placed, it was an input for the uh, uncertainty uh, of the weights, right, of the standard weight uh, in the RSS equation. And then for the measurement assurance, this is the largest number here, the 0 .20570. That was uh, plugged in for that in the S, uh, RSS equation. And then for the readability, this bottom number here, the 0 0.00577, was uh, plugged in for that in the RSS equation, right? And so when all those are uh, squared and then uh, summed and then square rooted, we get the combined uncertainty, right? Uh, and so once we get the combined uncertainty, for us to be able to get the expanded uncertainty, all we have to do is multiply this number right here, the combined uncertainty, by the k value, which is 2, right there, right? And so 0.2706289 uh, multiplied by 2 is equal to 0 0.0514, right? Or at two significant figures would just be 0 0.051, right? And that would be the expanded uncertainty. And this would be the value that you report as your uncertainty value when you measure anything on the balance, right? when you measure anything on the balance, or when you're doing a propagation of uncertainty, like we did in the previous video. That would be the uncertainty that you would use uh, when you use a, that particular balance, right? And so remember that four groups in the class, right, are doing uncertainty, bed, uncertainty budgets for four different balances, right? And so I expect what will happen is that you will share your uncertainties from each individual balance, and so for the rest of the semester, you'll have the appropriate uncertainty from the uncertainty budgets that each group did for each balance so that whenever you use one of the balance you'll know the correct number to use for your uncertainty and your uncertainty propagations right so um let's go the next thing to do then is to report the uncertainty how do we report the uncertainty well here we go uh we express the uncertainty like this so just say just for you know for fun here we measured out 409.98 grams right well, the uncertainty part of it comes in two parts, the interval and the confidence level. And we've already talked about the confidence level being at 95%, right? And so we will write out the, uh, uh, the, the, the result like this. Whoops, wrong way, sorry. The result like this, where 409.8 grams, right, uh, is plus or minus 0 0.04, just a made up number, uh, 0 0.04 grams, that's known as the interval, right? at a confidence level of 95%, right? 
right? And so that's how you should be reporting all of your different mass measurements, okay? That's how you should be reporting all of your different mass measurements. Uh, and so uh, all that work just to get to, to, to a number like for this, right? And the number like for this, right? Or more than a thousand data points is what you're taking to do this, right? Uh, the, uh, for the balance and the, for the balances that you're, you're making the, you're validating. So I forgot to say that another way, of, I may have said it already, but just if I haven't yet, uh, you're basically what we're doing is we're validating the balance using an uncertainty budget. And so, and you're also validating each of your liquid handling devices using an uncertainty budget. And you're doing all that just so that you can get this interval here for each balance and for each, uh, each balance, excuse me, and for each uh, liquid handling device, pipette or serological pipette or burette, and to make sure that everybody knows it's at a 95% confidence level, right? So I expect that all your results that you report to me will be in this format, okay? So this here is just another example of a different uh, uncertainty budget from the firearms unit, right, of, of, the, uh, of the crime lab. And here we're doing an example where uh, the force required to pull a trigger uh, is uh, is the uh, the tar the uh, uh, is the target no <laughs> is the subject of this uncertainty budget right and so the instrument being used here is called the trigger scan and it measures the amount of force in pounds that's required to pull the trigger of a firearm and this is important in uh, different investigations where a struggle. Uh, is involved and someone gets shot and and people will say for example as an excuse oh we were struggling and the firearm just went off on accident type of thing uh this is where that kind of investigation is uh, this kind of uh, uh uh analysis is important because if the firearm has a, a hair trigger right like a very light trigger pull then that's a possible uh, it's, it's very possible that the firearm went off when you were in a struggle but if the uh, uh, if the firearm had a very very heavy trigger pull, took a lot of force, then it's less likely that it went off just real easily in a uh, real easily in a uh, uh, a struggle, right? And so uh, this one is pretty automatic here, so I'm not going to write anything. I'll just show you our our type A sources here were different guns, right? And they're different trigger pulls, and so our type B sources are here uh, again hook weights or or uh, certified weights, just like they were on the balances, and then also the uh, 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 the read linearity and the readability of the trigger uh, trigger scan instrument, just like it was on the uh, the balances, right? And so we take a closer look at our look at our type A sources here, right? Again, these are just the standard deviations of the uh, the standard deviations of the uh, of each gun's trigger pull result uh, that was done 25 times or more, right? Uh, and so again, normal distribution, divisor of one, because the standard deviation can be the standard uncertainty uh, if it's a normal distribution uh, with the divisor of one. And so uh, the number is the same, basically, uh, is the same uh, for standard deviation and the standard uncertainty, okay? But the thing I did want you to notice here, though, is the, the, the number here that's marked out in red, which is the 1.64596, uh, uh, 96 value here, standard deviation, uh, at slash standard uncertainty uh, compared to the rest of them. Uh, you can see that that is an obvious outlier, right? It's much larger. It's it's an order of magnitude larger than the rest of the standard uncertainties. Uh, but we didn't just throw it out. We have to go through the appropriate statistical analysis to actually remove that data point. Uh, and so if you recall from the previous video I, uh, I made for you about the statistical test that we can use to remove outliers, we carried out a Grubbs test. And when we carried out the Grubbs test, it showed that this, <laughs> this particular data point was obviously uh, an outlier. So we were, uh, we were able to remove it without any kind of, uh, uh, any kind of guilt involved, right? Because it, it was shown to be an outlier through a statistical test. And that's the same thing you have to do too, if you have any kind of weird outlying data, okay? And so... Here are type B sources, just like before. And then our combined uncertainty here, right, which is the root sum of squares equation. And so the thing I really wanted to show you here is how, you know, we did drop the 1.6 value. So now the largest number that we have in that particular category is the 0.76. The largest that we had in the, uh, the two type Bs there, you can see, are 0 0.00006351 and 0 0.0557. Uh, for both those type B categories there. And then for the measurement uh, 
uh, repeatability there. Uh, that one type A, the highest we had was the uh, the 0 0.0457. And so all those numbers were squared and then summed, and then that's what gave us the combined uncertainty of 0.76786425.9, right? But again, we don't ever report uncertainties in that many decimal points. Uh, so again, how do we get to our expanded uncertainty? We have a coverage factor, a K of equals two there, as you can see. Uh, and so all you have to do is multiply that number by two. And when you multiply that number by two, that means, again, you have a coverage factor of two, and that's a 95% confidence interval, which also corresponds to no value being further away than two standard deviations from the mean. And so when we multiply 0 0.76786425.9 times two, we get this number here, which is 1.7, uh, sorry, 1.574. Uh, and then again, we do not report any uncertainties that are more than two significant figures, so we round that up to 1.6 pounds, right? And so, uh, as you can see, you don't have to just use a balance. You can't. You can. You can valid. Uh, you can validate using an uncertainty of measurement budget, any kind of measuring instrument. Okay. Uh, and so that's basically all you have to do. <laughs> and I say that, making it sound like uh, that's not a lot, right? Uh, honestly, the measuring part is the part that takes the longest, uh, where you are doing the 25 uh, weight measurements or ma uh, mass determinations for the standard weights, and then doing the mass determinations for the different volumes or different for the different liquid handling devices. That takes the longest. Once you get all the data and you plug it all into Excel, which I provided you the Excel files to plug in the data, uh, you just put in the appropriate equations, and Excel actually calculates everything for you, right? So. Uh, that ends this particular uh, PowerPoint or this particular video on how to carry out uh, a validation of an instrument, in this case a balance, uh, and uh, by using an uncertainty budget. If you have any questions, let me know, uh, and uh, I'll see you in class.